violence and how it's being uh, handled by family court services. And, um, you know, there's some issues. We, we set up family court in order to have a, a, a focused approach to handling some of these court cases. But we've, we've found some of these flaws that are in the system that we want to try to address. So I've sponsored multiple bills to try to address some of those problems. But some of the things that we really, really want to focus on are the need for judges to be educated in what I will call this new class of uh, abuse. A lot of it is, is uh, psychological abuse. There's no broken bones. There's no uh, you know, black and blue marks. But yet the scars are, are very deep. So with that, I'd like to introduce some others to uh, uh, talk about this issue and uh, take it away. Danielle, I'm sorry. Take it away, Danielle. <laughs> is it my turn? <laughs> yeah. My name is Danielle Pollock. I'm the policy manager at the National Family Violence Law Center at GW Law in Washington, D.C. And um, we focus on the intersection of domestic violence and child abuse. And we are the National Center for Research and Policy Development on these issues um, as they pertain to family court. And based on uh, a major empirical study that the center did, and um, which is reflective of other studies um, that have been done in countries on family courts, we developed policy um, which grew from Pennsylvania and then was eventually enacted federally in 2022. Um, it's nicknamed Cain's Law. It's named after the girl who was brutally murdered by her dad um, after she was court ordered to him to have parenting time, even though he had a history of uh, criminal activity and making dangerous threats to the family. Unfortunately, Caden is one of many such children across the country who gets court ordered um, to be with a dangerous parent when there is a perfectly safe and fit parent available. And this is happening for a few reasons but primarily because family courts are not uh, adequately trained and prepared to assess and recognize uh, abuse in these cases and risk to children. And as a result, children are getting harmed. So the federal law that was enacted um, is nicknamed Caden's Law. The actual title is Keeping Children Safe from Family Violence. It's part of the Violence Against Women Act. And we developed this policy over several years um, together with partners and experts around the country. And now um, states have an opportunity to enact these policies at the state level because custody is a state matter. It's up to states what their custody laws look like. And lawmakers, including Senator Fortunato, thank you, um, has reached out together with advocates to us to help provide technical assistance um, to introduce to the state level, also a House representative has a companion bill um, to represent the policies and cadence law. So we hope that Washington State will move forward with this um, important policy. What it would do would train courts um, um, in an evidence-based way in eight categories of abuse, including child abuse, child sexual abuse, coercive control, perpetrator behavior, and bias, something that the courts really are lacking training in currently. Um, it would also provide federal funding to the state if they uh, enact these provisions. It would limit um, testimony from quote unquote experts who are unqualified but are nevertheless testifying in these cases. It would limit reunification camps and treatments which are unsafe and unsound and which frequently force abused children to be um, in the presence of their abusive parent. Um, and it would require that courts look at all um, family violence evidence when they're making child custody decisions. So it's a very uh, thoughtful policy um, and we hope that Washington will lead as you have led on other issues. Um, of course, you're the fourth state to have a comprehensive course of control 
more oriented, which we helped with last year, um, thanks to Representative Goodman and some of your colleagues. And we um, look forward to Washington moving this forward. And we hope that the chairs, um, Chair Dana and Chair Taylor, will call these um, bills up for a hearing. Thank you. Hey, uh, Tina, you're up. Good morning. Um, my name is Tina Swiven. I am a survivor, an author, an advocate for family court reform, and I lead a very active support group for survivors and advocates in Washington. So this state is high on my radar as a state that is failing survivors of domestic abuse. In our present day family court system, parental rights trump child safety, even when there are substantiated findings of abuse. And if the residents of Washington state understood how low the bar has been set when it comes to a parent obtaining custody of a child, I believe they would be linking arms with us in outrage. And I invite them to do that. I invite everyone to demand Senate Bill 5879, which will protect children and save lives. When I first walked into the family court system, I believed that all I had to do was tell the truth. I trusted and expected that the professionals surrounding me had the same goal, which was child safety. And it was a harsh wake up call to step into the reality of the system. We are sending mixed messages to victims of domestic abuse. We tell them to be brave and to leave the relationship, yet when they do, it is almost as if they are assigned their own personal terrorist along with their family court case number. The family court system, which survivors are dependent on for protection, is enabling the abusers and fueling the reign of terror. These cases are unfortunately labeled as high conflict, but it is very important to recognize that it only takes one person to create conflict, and that is typically someone who's desperate to maintain power and control. We have a crisis on our hands, and it's called family court. When child safety is in question, it is common sense to err on the side of caution, but that's not what's happening in Washington. This court system, the family court system, is cradling the lives of children and survivors, yet it's best described as the wild, wild west. We have judicial officers playing Russian roulette with children's lives. There is no oversight, there's no regulation, and there's little recourse when a judge gets it wrong. Outcomes in family court cases would be different if judges were thoroughly trained on topics such as trauma, child abuse, domestic violence, and post-separation abuse. And it is shocking to learn that in Washington State, there are very minimal requirements for judges. I think it should be a glaring red flag if judges are against training in these critical topics because regardless of my profession, I would want every opportunity to be the best in my field, but even more so if my job involved decision-making that could impact the life of a child. We must come together and demand that our judicial officers are trained to recognize abuse as a key factor in decisions they are making. Children are in danger. These cases are dragging on for years, burdening the system and taxpayers. Senate Bill 5879, Caden's Law, will ensure that child safety is a priority for all. This is common sense. It is a, it's bipartisan legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Uh, what I would like to do is introduce Dana Tingley. Dana has a wide range of, of uh, perspectives on this and has been in the system uh, for a very long time and has a, a lot of experience with that. And she was also going to introduce the uh, Cox family uh, and, um, and tell their story. So thank you. Dana? 
Thank you, Senator. I am a resident here in the state of Washington. I am also a victim of domestic violence and a survivor of domestic violence. My children and I, um, for over 20 years, I was married to someone that um, was very inappropriate. I uh, used to see those papers on the wall of the pediatrician's bathroom that said, is someone hurting you in your life? You can get out. You don't need to worry. We'll help you. And I used to think that meant everyone but me. Who would believe me? Because I'd been told I wouldn't be believed. One day, um, I'll leave that part out, but I did uh, seek safety. And I was protected. And, I, and um, people rallied behind me until I hired an attorney and I had my protection order. And then all sorts of things started happening that I was very unprepared for, as were my children. Um, I then uh, spent many, many court hearings and uh, uh, defending myself against something that I hadn't done. Um, we use unscientific claims of this junk, disproved science called alienation in our state. And here I was asked to prove something that didn't happen, which means there's no evidence of it. Um, rather than be responsible for my children's relationship with their father, I thought I should be responsible for my relationship with my children and he should be responsible for his relationship with them. Instead, the court system turned all eyes on me. Um, I was able to get out. I am safe today. My children are safe today. The problem that I found is that this was really unfair. There was nothing in the state of Washington left to protect the children. And I'm an adult. Those of us that are an adult, we make our own choices. But the children have no choice in our state. A father's right, a parent's right, an abuser's right is weighed much higher than the right of the safety of a children of a child. I now have hundreds of uh, clients in the state of Washington. I protect survivors in the state of Washington, and we we try our hardest to find ways to reach the judges and those making decisions for us. The problem is they don't know. Um, there are seasoned judges that do have experience, but then there's many that don't. Uh, I was learned yesterday that a third of our judges have less than five years experience. What happens to those children that are in front of those judges? Um, it's not good. I've got a friend in a trial right now whose children were removed from her. She's a great person and a safe parent, but these fake junk science claims were made against her. It's not safe, it's not right. We need Caden's Law in our state. Congress has said this is the model. We've done these studies, we've done the research, this is the right way to go. The UN has accepted this as the right step in the right direction to help keep children safe. Why are we not doing that, Washington? Shame on us. Why are we letting other states enact this law? And we are not. We are the state of Washington. I want to be proud of our state. It's time. And if we hear from our other legislators that they've got something else in mind, why? Why do we think we know more than what has been researched and studied and we've seen the results? People are dying. Children are dying. Women are dying. It's not comfortable to talk about. If the judges Sorry, if the legislators, I will say, continue to not give Caden's Law a hearing, I will question and I will keep fighting until the proper information is put before our public. Legislators, do the right thing. This is not to be based on your relationship with the people who wrote other bills, your favors or friendships or someone's feelings being hurt. Think about the children that have died. If you can have a hand in educating the judges here that are making those decisions and give them a chance to make the right decision, you should do that based on what's right. I want to introduce you to my friends, Chuck and Judy Cox. Their daughter is Susan Powell. They lost their grandchildren here in our state because a judge ordered visitation with an unsafe father. They pleaded with the courts to do the right thing. The father's rights was given more consideration than the child's safety. This needs to stop. With that, let me introduce you to Chuck Cox. Thank you. 
I've been in okay. I've been in the uh, testifying before the the state before uh, for Charlie's and Braden's law, which was going into effect, which basically said that uh, if a uh, spouse goes missing and the the uh, remaining spouse is given custody and the sp that spouse is not cooperating with police under professional things that obviously you can't make the other person disappear and then you win custody. And that was okay, but it got drug down and other things that go on in, in the state and, and the, so that's gone. Uh, the state D Department of Social Health Services uh, DSHS and the state did favor the father, the the abuser, in the in the situation who had no. It was about possession for that father, not about the safety of the children. And anyway, and in the end, the actions of the DSHS and not necessarily the judges, because the judge was just going by the law at that time. Uh, but the neglect and disregard for the current policies and procedures and, and rules at the time uh, allowed uh, the father to kill our children, our grandchildren. Um, through a jury, we have proved that they were negligent. Uh, the state still does not accept that. Uh, but my uh, my experience is just the same is that I thought family court was going to protect the child, that they were good people trying to protect them. And there are some good people, but protection of the child is not, not the situation. So I think Caden's Law is what we need, a step in the right direction to give the judges and those in this with decision-making powers the information, the tools they need to more adequately protect children in the state. My name is Jody Cloutier, and I am a family law attorney from Redmond. My practice specializes in representing survivors of domestic violence in complex divorce matters. I'm here to talk about some of the problems I see as a practitioner and someone who fights for survivors really every day. The fact of the matter is that this is a comprehensive package of reforms that should not be a left or right issue. Victims of domestic violence and how children are affected by domestic violence really is a nonpartisan issue and it deserves a hearing. Now this package addresses some of the real problems we have in the family court system. At the top level, the biggest problem is we have a lot of judges um, who have little to no family law experience. Though family law matters represent a significant portion of all cases in the Superior Court. What we know is that most of the judges that are in the system really have a criminal background and have almost no family law background whatsoever. 5879 Cadence Law would address that. It's going to uh, require certain training and that judges and have information about domestic violence that they need. The fact of the matter is the legislature amended the domestic violence statute a couple of years ago in RCW 7105 and really took the lead in advancing the ball on issues related to domestic violence, specifically around the pernicious issue of coercive control. What I find as a practitioner is that judges don't understand the statute. They're not applying it. And so as these issues come up, especially in the context of a survivor trying to escape uh, the, their perpetrator in a, domestic, in a divorce action, judges just aren't getting what the legislature asked them to do. We need to deal with that. We also have 5879 and 5868. Uh, 5879 is a family court study. Uh, we have a, a wide range of family courts in the state of Washington. Uh, I practice in several counties and I will tell you that there is a wide disparity between counties as to how the family court systems work. 
I think we need to do a study. We need to figure out what's working, what's not working, and we need to have some recommendations. That's going to be a very important part of this comprehensive package. We also have 5861. And the big thing to learn about 5861 is it allows survivors of domestic violence to capture the evidence they need to prove their abuse. All too often in cases, a survivor of domestic violence will try to record uh, their abuser. And the way the statute works right now is that they are not allowed to use that evidence, or even worse, they could be sued civilly by their perpetrator for making a recording without two-party consent. That's really important. 5861 also deals with the issue of child support and making sure that individuals uh, pay their child support. It raises the standard uh, for those perp the uh, payers to meet before they can assert the defense of I can't afford to pay. It also contains significant reforms that allow judges the authority to have de the Department of Child Support collect on, ch on child support even if that's not what was otherwise ordered. The problem we have in the existing process is that judges don't have that authority and you have to go through a complex and very expensive process to do that. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't protect children. We have two other bills that deal with credit reporting fairness uh, and making sure that child custody misconduct is uh, considered. We need to deal with that. We have, a, we have a, I would say in Washington overall, we have a good family court system, but that doesn't say there aren't problems that need to be addressed. This comprehensive package addresses those issues. And I, I think the, the victims of domestic violence, and especially children, deserve a, a hearing on these bills. Thank you. So what we've, what we've tried to do is bring to, to light some of these issues. And, and again, I want to go back to uh, most of what we're talking about is psychological abuse. We're talking about something where there's no broken bones, there's no bruises. How do you prove that? Uh, you know, Jody brought up the point that, uh, you know, recording. When you write something down on a piece of paper, and you, you, you write down what could be, oh, I was just joking when I said that. But when you hear a recording and you hear the context and you hear the way that it's presented, it totally changes the approach on that. So how exactly is a woman and, and a spouse, uh, but 98% of the time it's, a, it's, the, it's the woman, how would they be able to prove this psychological abuse without being able to record that interaction. How would you do it? It's just a he said, she said situation. So with that, um, I'll be uh, open for any questions. But the standards that they're using are also outdated to determine custody? It's mostly centered around this coercive control thing. You know, and again, remember, this is a psychological thing. It, it's very easy to prove abuse when you have a broken bone. But it's not easy to, to, uh, to prove a, a psychological or, or, or a badgering, repeated badgering. Um, verbally. Can you speak on it? Yeah. So. Hi, my name is Shira Cole and I run an organization that advances the voices of specifically uh, victims of domestic violence in family court. And based on my own personal story, um, my abuser was incarcerated the entire time my child was alive and it was impossible for me to prove physical violence. Um, all I had were emails and so we went for a DVPO before he was released and it was it was denied because there was no physical abuse. The course of control bill came into effect afterwards and I was, I was granted protection. Um, before that, the, um, it's not just judges that are gonna get this training, potentially. It would be all um, professionals, like evaluators, guardian ad litems. And in my case, what happened was is that the, um, a lot of the other professionals are taking trainings that are believe it or not, influenced by abuser rights groups. It, they don't directly influence them, but they do. They, they, they talk to other purportedly neutral organizations, and those organizations 
influence the trainings. They influence a lot of organizations that purport to have a neutral stance. Um, so in my case, the evaluator dis, 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 did not believe and did not recognize the harms despite the 30 felony convictions that my ex had and recommended a step-up plan to overnights. I believe that if I didn't quit my job and take a part-time staying at home to represent myself, this could have happened, this could have been my reality. Um, luckily, the Forest Control Bill went into effect before my trial, and because I was able to represent myself I, very, very effectively, which a lot, most survivors don't have the opportunity, I was able to get safety. Um, this is not, this, my case is not like most other cases. It, most cases, these survivors go to court underrepresented. They run out of money by the time they get to trial. The trial is a sales pitch. Whoever has the strongest sales pitch convinces the judge. And the more you add discretion into the law, the more you enable the person that has more money. And it's not just about money, it's also about bias and about these abuser rights groups infiltrating other organizations to infiltrate other organizations to discount what what we as survivors need, what our children need, what keeps our children safe. Thank you. So, you know, she touches on a couple of points where you mentioned the, the training and that how broad this is also. It's not only the judges, but um, one of the things that's uh, addressed in uh, one of the bills is the training of family court services people that are supposed to be doing parental investigations. They have absolutely no training. They have no ethics standards. They have no requirements to meet. So one of the bills that we have says, well, at least that person who's supposed to be doing a uh, evaluation on a parenting plan should at least be trained to the same level that a guardian ad litem is. And I mean, that's a gaping hole. Uh, I do want to touch on uh, judge's discretion because that's kind of what King's Law tries to bring into uh, 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 attention to. But in Washington, repeatedly we, we've talked to experts from around the country and they point to the fact that Washington's judges have way too much discretion. If, if, a, 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 if we had a situation where the judge had unlimited discretion and you felt that your, your case was mishandled or, or you felt wronged or you didn't agree with the judge's uh, opinion, because his entire, the entire thing would be based on discretion, there would be no opportunity for appeal. You would have no right to go back to the court to, uh, to have your uh, uh, concerns re uh, addressed. I've talked to a couple of other judges and they said, you know, we actually like having some sideboards. We actually like to have some guidance from the, uh, uh, from the legislature on what we're supposed to be considering. So uh, what, uh, again, one of the other bills does is it tries to establish those sideboards. Uh, family court services is re repeatedly, and judges' rulings, repeatedly making women homeless. They're granting them the, uh, we're, we're granting you the, uh, the home, but then they can't afford the home. They have to sell a home. And when they sell a home, they have to pay the real estate excise tax. They have to pay the, uh, 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 you know, realtor fee, et cetera. So when, when the house is actually sold and the proceeds are divided, the person who winds up taking care of the kids many times winds up being homeless. So that's also addressed in, in one of the bills. So any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, and I hope. Oh, go ahead. And if I if I just make a comment on something that you said, Senator, and also Shira said, um, regarding what we call third-party neutrals, which are custody evaluators and guardians ad litem, for example, and as you rightly stated, um, the the provisions in Cadence Law um, account for evidence-based training um, for those third-party neutrals as well as judges. And the reason why this is so important is those figures, um, recommendations, and reports weigh very heavily on how judges' decision make for where children should go. And as you rightly say, Senator, 
they have very little evidence-based training on the facts of child abuse and child sexual abuse and how that intersects with um, domestic violence uh, and course of control. And you have something in your current law in Washington that says um, if a child has been found to have been sexually abused by a parent, if an evaluator or a therapist for the child says that it's safe uh, and fine for the child to go back and have contact with that parent who has been found by a court to se have sexually abused them, um, that that's okay. So if you have a person who's a, who's a custody evaluator who has next to no training or expertise on child sexual abuse, on the trauma that it causes, and on what a child really needs to be safe in all ways, not just physically, but also psychologically, and that evaluator has the power to determine whether that uh, sexually abusive parent can have parenting time with their child victim, you really have a problem. So um, at the very least, these people who are making these determinations and recommendations should have appropriate training. And if they're gonna testify or provide evidence in these cases, um, they need to be experts in the kind of abuse that they're uh, providing evidence on. And King's Law accounts for that. So um, the bill that's moving forward um, that had a hearing yesterday, um, which is anecdotally referred to as the um, judge's bill, HB 2237, um, and is supported by some domestic violence victims in your state, has not addressed this um, part, which we find really uh, dangerous for children, frankly, um, to have people who are untrained on the facts of abuse or very poorly trained, um, you know, making recommendations or decisions whether sexual abuse children should have uh, parenting time with the person who hurt them. Um, that's one of the many concerns we have with that with that bill. So I know that um, there have been a lot of questions around it, and as you said, Senator, um, expanding discretion for judges and um, and court personnel um, when they really are not properly prepared um, to make assessments on abuse is 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 dangerous, and it's um, it's not the direction that will be beneficial and helpful. Um, for, for victims, especially children. So we do hope that um, the conversation will open up and that um, lawmakers, your colleagues in, in both chambers will consider um, the proposals in Cadence Law uh, that have been uh, approved in a bipartisan fashion by Congress. Um, this is not a, a partisan issue. It's not a Democratic or Republican issue. Child abuse and child safety is a nonpartisan issue, and I hope that um, your colleagues will be reflecting that when they're considering the proposals before them. Thank you. So she also touches on a point where you, you repeatedly hear a couple of different words being used. One is the training, and training discretion, but the other one was evidence. What would you do if a judge used their discretion to say, I don't want to hear any evidence. What would you do? How would you represent your client? How would you, how would you make your case if you were not allowed to introduce evidence on your behalf? So these are some of the things that, that we really seriously need to, to uh, address. And you know, introduce yourself. Hello, I am Tamara Emerson, and I am a victim of family court as also domestic violence. We need framework for judges to be able to rule in favor of child safety. We need uh, less discretion. In my case, the judge threw out evidence and ruled 50-50 custody, sending my children back to their abuser based on her discretion. I was denied on appeal, and my, my, the appeal opinion simply reads, we do not reweigh evidence or factor in credibility. We, family law has a huge discretionary to enter parenting plans. So when we give judges discretion, we can appeal that. We have to train, we have to uh, address bias, we have to address opinion, because we have to have a law that gives framework 
on what they can and cannot do so that we can protect children. My kids went back to live 50-50 and they were abused again. We have to have court reform. These bills will give direct direction to our judicial officers, people involved in custody disputes, evaluators, experts, the guidelines on how to understand children whenever they are disclosing abuse, the factors of survivors and how they respond to abuse, and how we can correctly identify perpetrators. Thank you. So, you know, once you start talking about this, people come out of the woodwork and want to tell their story. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we can bring this up to, uh, you know, shine some light on these concerns and that we can address some of those issues. Okay. We don't have anything else. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. I appreciate the 